Thank, thanks, Barry. Good morning, everybody. I'll just start this up. So, mandatory disclaimer. Just a little bit of a corporate snapshot, and really what I'm going to do, rather than talk about that, is just talk a little bit about Alcane first. Basically, in uh, May of this year, we celebrated our 50th birthday, um, and I can assure you that, contrary to uh, public opinion, I wasn't there at the time. But it's, like most junior companies, it's evolved over that period, and certainly the last 20 years or 30 years have been quite interesting of, of to where it's going. So, looking at that, current market cap's about 370 million. We've got about 74 million uh, in the bank, and we're generating that largely from a cash flow from our gold mining operation. So, a little, little map. Um, you have to try and remember this so I don't have to keep coming back. And I'm sorry to go to the right. I was just thinking, watching everybody today and yesterday, where everybody goes to the right, and I'm going to perhaps bring in my left leaning and go to the left. So, excuse me on the right. So, basically, there's Peak Hill. And there's Tommingley, so they're in the central west region of New South Wales. Uh, there's the city of Dubbo, city of Orange down there, both about 45,000 people. Uh, very good infrastructure in the area, power, uh, people, water, mostly water. Um, not a lot of it right now, but it's, it's still there. And we started out by putting the PQL project into development in 1998. So a heat leach operation cost us the vast sum of $5 million capital to get it running. And at that time, the gold price was about 400 an ounce, and we were operating at 350 an ounce. When the gold price went to 450, we were making $100 an ounce, and I tell you, it was party time. So you sit back and think, and you look today, if you're thinking you're getting less than $500 an ounce uh, margin, you think it's pretty desperate. So the funds that we generated from Peak Hill, um, we embarked upon a program of multi-commodity exploration and development, and the view being that we thought we would find and develop anything that we thought we could make money out of, and that sort of led us to ultimately the, uh, the bringing in of the Dubbo project that, that Barry referred to. One of the first discoveries was Tommingley, oops, was Tommingley just up the road from Peak Hill? That's the Newell Highway there, by the way, which links uh, Melbourne to Brisbane, about the fifth busiest road in the country. And we found Tommingley, and Tommingley, just to put it into perspective, is an orogenic gold deposit. When people come and visit us at Tommingley and they look at the rocks and they look at what's going on there, it's basically they could be in the eastern gold fields of Western Australia. It's the same style of rock. We're not talking about things that uh, we'll talk about in a moment, which is the monzonite porphyries. It's a classic orogenic deposit. Um, that's, that cranked up in 2014. And out of that, we have then continued to advance our exploration activities. And I'll talk about this. <laughs> I'll talk about this, what we now call the Tommingley Corridor down here in a moment, but I'm also going to refer to the discovery over here at Boda, which is, seems to be a large porphyry copper gold system, and I'll also mention a little bit about the Dubbo project at the end. So that's what we've achieved um, with, with Tommingley. When Tommingley started up, it was just under a million ounce resource. The open pits were somewhat restricted by the, the Newell Highway, which uh, bisected the project. So we've produced about 360,000, 370,000 ounces to date out of the open pits. We're now transitioning to underground, and that underground mine is just about to come into production. And over the next year or two, it'll basically tick along at about 40,000, 35, 40,000 ounces a year until we bring these new discoveries on, on stream, which I'll show you in a moment. The cash flow from that's been substantial. It's enabled us to fund all of our other activities. It's enabled us to, to, to fund what we've done with the Dubbo project and get that to a point where it's ready to, to go into development. So that's an aerial shot of the site. So at the top end, you can see the, the Tommingley open pits. If I, excuse me again for turning left, but there's the Newell Highway running right down through the middle of the site. All the infrastructure, the two, the three, the two pits on that side, two pits on that side. We have an underpass under the Newell Highway, again, the measly sum of $5 million to, to connect the both sides of the mine, uh, but basically it's worked out quite well. And currently, the underground mine's developed it in Wyoming 1, and uh, it will proceed over the next two or three years, and probably enable us to continue that production rate of around 40,000, 50,000 ounces a year until we bring on these other deposits. So the other deposits I'm referring to uh, naturally, all the way down the highway. And people say to us, your exploration strategy is very clear. You find a major road and you, you just dig it underneath and there's a deposit underneath it. So, yeah, I, I can accept that. 
So what we've discovered to date is mineralisation extends all the way south from Wyoming, down through here, down through what we call Roswell, San Antonio, and then down to El Paso. And our peak oil mine's about another eight kilometres to the south, and there's no work's been done in that corridor to date, no serious work. So we focused on the area immediately close to the mine, uh, Roswell and San Antonio particularly. Those little pink dots are all drill holes greater than one gram. And there is a substantial resource potential evolving out of that. We put out, we published an exploration target. That exploration target, somewhere between 900,000 and 1.6 million ounces. I think ultimately this system, particularly when we join up San Antonio to El Paso, is more than capable of holding 2 million ounces. So if we go to the next one, this is a, a long section. I've tried to just demonstrate the long section of what we're seeing. So the reason that these deposits south of the mine site have remained undiscovered is because they're all under cover. So you can see that boundary there. That's, the, uh, that's transported over burden. There's no geochemical signature in that material, so there's no indication that there's significant mineralisation below it. And we developed an exploration technique, I guess, to how we explore that, what we find, and then what we go back and RC drill. And that led us to ultimately discovering, initially, El, El Paso of all things, right down here to the south, and then came back and picked up San Antonio and Roswell. That zone there is about 1.5 kilometres long. There's a one kilometre gap, and then another one kilometre long zone of mineralisation. And the reason why that gap hasn't been infilled is because just in here, the alluvials get to about 40 to 50 metres deep, and it sort of wasn't going to be an immediate open pit target. What we're seeing now is if the system develops as we, as we think, it will need to be drilled out sometime in the near future. So currently we're about one third of the way through 60,000 metre RC drill out program and diamond drilling program, and which we'll probably get uh, initial resource numbers out towards early, probably early next year, and then we'll take that from there. On to the, the porphyry system. So if you can remember the map, we're about 80 kilometres uh, east of Dubbo now in a very prospective monzonite porphyry intrusive complex. Uh, we call it the North Molong Porphyry Project, just want of a, of a better name or a summary name. Cadia, the largest known deposit in the region, is about 100 kilometres to the south of the image here, down there. But what drives this system here, and again, it's another overnight success, we've been working on it for 15 years, is a large intrusive, monzonite intrusive complex in here, uh, which is about a 10 kilometre corridor. And why it's sort of taken a lot of time is basically there's a lot of mineralisation scattered around in the surface in this area. A lot of the stuff we focused on initially was up in the north end up here, and then we've finally come down to the south and started to look closely at the, in the south end. And when you look at that Boda Kaiser area, you come across to this, it's about a three kilometre corridor of monzonite, monzodiorite intrusives, and lots of scattered mineralisation. I don't know how well you can see, but in here there are a number of drill intercepts. The ones in pale, pale colour, and they're the sort of intercepts we got probably up to about uh, 2016, 2017. Very interesting, but not really enough to get motivated to come in and do significant drilling. But certainly zones of 50 to 100 metres 0.4, 0.5 gold, 0.1, 0.2 copper. With a little bit more science, we came back and said, well, there's an RC hole with 300 metres of about 0.3 gold. Uh, it, that, if we think what it's showing, it's showing us they're in a, we're in a, a zoned, vertically zoned system. So we ultimately came in and drilled uh, this diamond hole here, the one that goes through the, the core of the centre, and that's turned up a very substantial intersection, which I'll show you a piece of in a moment. But just to digress briefly, to talk about the, the porphyry copper gold models in the, in the Macquarie Arc or the Lachlan Fold Belt, these are two fantastic, or well, they modified, two fantastic diagrams that Newcrest published. When they put out um, presentations in the last three or four months, they've attached to that presentation a thing called the Newcrest Briefing Book. And if you want to understand the Lachlan uh, Macquarie Arc porphyry systems and the mining techniques to apply to those, have a look at that because they're fantastic. So what I've done is steal that information and then produce some sort of models. So without going into too much detail, what we know about the systems is that they are zoned vertically, 
So they get a broad outer alteration halo, we call it propylytic, and then an inner potassic alteration halo, usually around a relatively small, narrow monzonite intrusive. That's the Cadia Ridgeway model, that's the North Parks model over there. And if you know that what, where those are, you know what you, where you are in the system, you can actually suggest that you can find a, a core of these systems, high-grade core of these systems at depth or a long strike. And this little dotted line's a rough estimate of where that diamond drill hole we put went through the system. So you can see that we went through the propylytic halo in then into the core of that thing. This is an idea of the Cady system, so you're looking at something that's 5.5 kilometres long. Those are all their drill holes. It's a historic drill hole compilation. You can see these major red blobs of which are the ore bodies, and that's a plus 40 million ounce inventory. So that's the drill hole. That's what we call our, our boater discovery hole. Um, I won't go back into this other than to say that's the zonation. So there's the mineralisation and, and zonation we saw in the upper part of the RC hole, down then into the broader uh, intercept in the main part of the, of the core of the porphyry system. Again, there's the numbers. I won't, I won't uh, go back to them. But basically, you've got to think about Cadia this has a grade of about 0.4 uh, gold and about 0.2 copper. And that's the 2 billion or 3 billion tonne ore body based on that. So too early to say, is this like that? Uh, certainly we believe it's got the potential to be, uh, be something of great significance. And we, we do agree that it's probably the most spectacular intersection in New South Wales in probably 20 years. So now I'm going to do something quite different because we're now part of the alternate investment conference, a very quick snapshot of our Dubbo project, which has equally been around for about 20 years. Uh, it's a very large resource of those metals, uh, zirconium, hafnium, rare earths and niobium. We've developed a flow sheet that gets those out into, into marketable forms. We've spent the last seven or eight years globally walking, going around, trying to get those, uh, to be able to market those products. Our biggest competition is China, um, China with both zirconium output and the rare earth output, which makes it a ver they're very different uh, party to compete against. But we think we are making progress, and probably the most exciting thing is that in June, we announced a, a joint venture with a, a Korean or South Korean University, Chungnam National University, who have developed this uh, very innovative clean metal electrolysis process, uh, which really comes to a new level in the sense that its operating cost about half the existing processes. Its only emissions are, are oxygen, so there's no nasty um, carbon dioxide, perish the thought. Um, and it's, it's the really exciting thing is that this, the target initially was for the zirconium and hafnium production, which the new... The, South Korean nuclear industry required, but equally we realised that it was, could be used for titanium, for the critical rare earths, neodymium and prosodium. It could also be used for production of aluminium and magnesium. So not only would you see it as a short-term application for what we're doing with the Dubbo project, there's a broader application as a standalone business built off that clean metal technology. And that's something we're going to pursue quite, uh, quite strongly in the next... Uh, 12 months, probably by the end of next year we look to have a commercial operation set up doing that. And hopefully that will then lead back to funding of the main Dubbo project itself and uh, ultimately get that, that large valuable project up and running. So I think I'm probably just inside my time limit and uh, just let it, I mean realistically what, we, you know, that little note there does, is exactly what we do. We've got a very good find and discovery record. Uh, we try to enhance them. And at times, we, we make the decision. For example, we found an iron ore deposit in Western Australia many years ago. We knew we didn't want to develop it. We floated it off and it became BC iron. Um, we also, in joint venture with Newmont, found the McPhillamy's gold deposit, decided collectively with Newmont that we would uh, agree to sell it. The $70 million we pocketed for our share basically enabled us to fund Tommingley without any debt facility. So we're a, a flexible, multi-focused company that's capable of doing good things, and I think there's a lot of people and a lot of hard work that have gone into achieving to where we are today. Thank you.